This is our eighth episode of Foundations of Christian Hedonism, focusing now on argument number seven in defense of this claim right here that Christian hedonism is right and true when it affirms that it is the God-given duty of all people to pursue their fullest and longest pleasure, namely pleasure in God. Psalm 1611 is the warrant for that expression, you make known to me the path of life. God made it known we should follow it, pursue it with all of our might, 24-7, every day of our lives, in your presence. That's where the, the life leads, the path leads. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Therefore, be about the great business and duty, demand, command, joy of pursuing that fullest and longest pleasure. That's what we're arguing for. Here's the seventh argument. We should pursue our fullest and longest life of joy. And I'm putting it like that, as you will see from a text in a minute. Life of joy. And that includes eternal life, I'm going to argue. And, you know, if you are, if you offered me 80 or 90 or 120 years of exquisite happiness here followed by hell, I would say, no thanks, not a deal. But if you offered me 80 years of suffering here and eternity of bliss and joy, uncompromised in God's presence, I'd say, of course. So the longest life of joy in God and here's the reason. We should pursue that longest life of joy in God because the biblical doctrine of self-denial assumes that's what we should pursue and calls for it. Didn't mean to write two of those. All right, let's see where in the world you get that idea. Here's the words of Jesus on self-denial. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Now, a cross is not a burden because it's heavy. It is death because it's a place of execution. So this is death. This is death to self. Some self in us has to die, has to be denied. We are sinners. That self is made up of all kinds of desires that are wicked, unbelieving, rebellious, finds all kinds of pleasure in things it shouldn't. It must go to the cross and then follow Jesus. So something dies on the cross, something follows Jesus. Here's his argument. The reason that needs to happen is because whoever would save his life will lose it. What kind of argument is that? If you try to save this life that ought to die, you're going to lose your life. And you don't want to lose your life, so be about not saving your life. That's the paradoxical way he's arguing, right? Whoever would save his life will lose it. And you don't want to lose it. So don't do this. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. And you do want to save it. That's the whole basis of the argument. None of this would make sense if Jesus didn't assume that we don't want to lose it and we do want to save it. That's the basis of the argument. This argument is based on a Christian hedonist principle that the people he's talking to don't want this to happen and do want this to happen. So if you want this to happen, then be willing for this to happen. Lose your life for my sake and the Gospels, and you'll save it. And of course you want to save it. And... Whoever would save his life will lose it. You don't want that to happen, so don't let that happen. Don't devote yourself to saving a life that ought to be on the cross. Do devote your life to any losses necessary 
for the sake of Christ and the gospel, and you'll save it. So what, what is he assuming? He's assuming the rightness, indeed the inevitability, of longing to pursue the fullest life of joy, the longest life. You don't want to lose your life. You want a long life of joy, an eternal life of joy. You want to save it. So he's giving instructions for how we can have this life of joy in God. The biblical doctrine of self-denial assumes that's what we should pursue, namely, don't lose your life, save your life, whatever it costs. Go to the cross with God, with Jesus. Now, just to clarify, here's this parable we saw earlier. Matthew 13, 44 describes a kind of self-denial, doesn't it? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and then what does he do? He, he, he gets rid of everything. He goes and sells all that he has. That's self-denial. You sell your car, you sell your books, you sell your house, you sell your clothes, you sell everything. And the world looks at you and says, you're, you're crazy. Or in another context, it says, you're hating. You're hating the things that you sell. And you say, no, actually, I'm not hating them. I have found a treasure hidden in the field. His name is Jesus Christ. And he is so valuable that my satisfaction in him makes this self-denial, this loss, gain. Which is what Paul says in Philippians 3. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. That's self-denial. For the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. That's self-denial. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In other words, this teaching about self-denial and voluntary loss here assumes that we want to have what is most valuable and satisfying. For his sake, I have suffered the loss, self-denial, of all things. And I count them as rubbish. In order that, this is what I'm pursuing. Gain Christ. I want the greatest treasure. I don't want worldly treasures. I want the big treasure. I don't want half-baked, two-bit, short-lived pleasures. I want the big pleasure, the one that lasts forever. So that's my argument. Wherever you look in the New Testament and find self-denial being commended, it's never ultimate self-denial, meaning I'd like to go to hell for Jesus. Jesus would be dishonored if he thought that we thought following him would send us to hell. It doesn't send us to hell, it sends us to God. He died in order that he might bring us to God, who's Presence is fullness of joy. Let me read in closing this quote from C.S. Lewis. And I have to admit, I didn't see all these things in the Bible by myself. I, I got help. And one of my helpers back when I was in my 20s was Lewis. And this is the sort of thing he was saying that simply staggered me. We are told, he said in, in pages 1 and 2 of The Weight of Glory, we are told to deny ourselves and take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do contains an appeal to desire. In other words, God does not summon us to take up our cross and deny ourselves without appealing to desire for life, for joy, for hope, for satisfaction. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that the Lord finds our desires not too strong, 
but too weak. I suppose that sense had set me back reassessing everything in my life because I thought up till that time that strong desires were my problem. They aren't. My desires are too weak. That's my problem. Desires for God are too weak. Desires for Christ are too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Got that? Our desire for this is too weak. And our desire for this and this and this is too strong. And we're like stupid little inexperienced children. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. There's our calling as Christians. Help people see that they are like children making mud pies in the slums with their portfolios when they are offered a holiday at the sea that lasts forever in the presence of God. So my argument is we should pursue the fullest and longest life of joy in God because the biblical doctrine of self-denial assumes that is what we should pursue and calls for it.